Um, so I'm a, uh, a fortuitous guest of my friend Sandy and Raul, who I've just met, and uh, I get to be the moderator, Adam Lindemann. I'm a Calder collector and an NFT fan and interested um, collector and someone interested in the world of crypto. I'm also a fan of TR Lab, of Sin and Audrey. So full disclosure, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of this whole project. And I just want to tell you a quick little story that Sandy and I have been talking about Web3 and crypto for many, many years. Back in 2018, I wanted to launch a cryptocurrency of art. It didn't happen because crypto went like this. And Sandy was already interested in talking about Web3, how Calder could participate in the metaverse and Web3 and all these terms that we didn't yet have. But what I love about this project, before I ask you who the first question is, it's very forward, it's very avant-garde, it's a very conservative art world. You would think that the art world would be forward thinking, a world of free thinking, but in fact, the, the true art world can often be very conservative. And Sandy is at the forefront of bringing the first really great legend of the 20th century into the world of the internet. So I applaud you for that, Sandy. I think it's wonderful, I really do. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll begin. The first question is, how did you two come together and how did this process begin? Um, well, um, th this whole thing about crypto is also super fascinating. I've been thinking about crypto for about eight years. I actually counted back to um, the idea of fractional ownership in Calder, and is there a public to be served? Like, not even a financial question, but how do you get people more connected to Calder? And partly it could be through a $100 ownership. So you could have a whole bunch of people that would actually literally own a little chunk of Calder, like you'd have a group of Calder, and you could sell them on the blockchain, or a percentage of them, like all those kinds of ideas started about eight years ago. The fractionalization, people are doing this now, of course, but Eight years ago, it was a, kind of a new idea of how to get people to feel, feel connected. People have talked about the Mona Lisa being fractionalized, and of course the moon is fractionalized already, and the stars, you can buy a star, you can name a star, because there are billions of stars, so you can, you can do that kind of thing. Um, so it seemed like a way to get people engaged. It's always been about engagement. Um, when NFTs became a, a, a subject before it became a non-subject, a super boring and hot, toxic subject, um, like it was a few weeks ago, and now it's good again. Um, I like that, you laugh, thank you very much. Um, so, a couple years ago, the Calder Foundation got approached by many, many different parties to do Calder NFTs, and that meant take a pre-existing work of art and make a digital reproduction of it and sell it to idiots who would just buy it. And that really was not interesting. You didn't like the idiot part. But it's, it's um, pre-existing art should not be made into NFTs. And now some artists have made native digital works of art in the NFT sphere that can only exist in the NFT sphere. They don't exist in, you know, as a canvas on the wall. Those are, those, some of those are, are really exciting and interesting. Um, and people want to belong to that society, and it's a new thing, and then... They're legitimate. Like them or not, they're valid, they're legitimate. As works of art on the internet. This, on the blockchain, indefinitely, which in itself is kind of interesting. We couldn't afford three microphones, so um, Raul has his own. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so the Calder Foundation really um, distrusted all of these proposals that were really just a financial question of how to you know, sell stuff, and that was not interesting. Um, and then I had a conversation just last December with Sin and Audrey in, at Art Basel Miami, and we were sitting talking, and they were, they were very persuasive about community. Like, wait a second, that's bullshit. Everybody's been talking about creating community with NFTs, and it's really just a financial thing. And they were like, no, here, we have a different strategy. And as we're talking, 
walks along Hans Ulrich Oberst, and I say, hey, Hansito, come sit with us. Let's be part of this conversation. And he's listening. And at the end of the conversation, I said, so should I do it? And he's like, it's imperative. You know him. He's like, you must. It's imperative. And um, so we decided to do it, not because of his imperative, but it was really persuasive. Audrey basically said, you have a chance to bring young people who are not going to museums, maybe don't even know who Calder is, and you can convince them that there's something to explore and something to connect to, back to the question of connection, through this process of um, engagement that eventually evol evolved into being an educational experience. So as some of you know, the process is that you study, you, you get a token for free, so all you need is a wallet. Anybody who doesn't know what a wallet is, ask Audrey, she's right there. Um, and you get this token for free. Second, raise your hand, everyone in this room who has a wallet, please, right now. 40%, good, yeah. Notice I did not raise my hand. Um, Raul, you didn't raise your hand. I think it's assumed I have a wallet. I wasn't sure whether you meant leather or uh, electronic, so yeah. I don't know. You're funny. Um, okay, so to finish the story, so uh, Audrey and Sin come up with this proposal, which is to study Calder and engage people to study Calder and be tested on how well you studied and pass the test and then go to the next level of study and pass the test. And along the route, the people that have gone to this trouble are able to buy an NFT. Now, frankly, and Audrey, don't hate me for saying this, I don't care if you buy the NFT or not. That's not my, I'm not interested in people to buy NFTs and so on. And that's also why they're very small editions. They're just 32 of each of the five NFTs because, well, because 1932 is the invention of the mobile, and these are all mobile sculpture NFTs. Um, so, invention of the mobile, is, what does that mean exactly? Because when Calder creates the mobile, Marcel Duchamp names it. So is it the invention when Marcel Duchamp names it? Is it when Calder creates it? What point is the invention? Just curious. And because this Hello. is going to be a, a, one of the questions on the test, so you might want to pay attention. Wait, I, can't, I can't answer that question. I can't give away the test, but there are a lot of questions. All right. So Adam is super smart. As you, anyone of you who knows Adam knows he's asking this question for a reason. Um, we all think of the suspended mobile as what Calder invented and what Marcel Duchamp named gave this, uh, this nickname, Mobile, but actually it was a series of motorized constructions that sat on pedestals. Um, some of them even hung on the wall, like a painting, that were motorized with little objects that moved and made um, balletic, performative, changing compositions. And it was Duchamp, Duchamp actually came into Calder's studio, and it's 1931, and he's there, and he's surprised by this whole new body of work. He literally says, can I touch it? They're talking about one work. And it's wet paint. And Duchamp gets paint all over his hands. Weirdly, he's caressing this sculpture, which is kind of weird. Um, but he asked to caress it, to touch it. And Calder said, what should I call it? Calder's just saying, hey, what should I call it? To his friend. And his friend, who happens to be Marcel Duchamp, says, mobile. And then it becomes this whole idea, because mobile is a pun, which in French is referring to both motivation and motion, movement and motivation, motive. Um, and Calder seizes this term. And then Duchamp arranges a show of those works at Gary Vignon. So that's 31. And the beginning of 32 in February is the very first show of Mobile, which is Calder's Se Mobile, Calder's motivations, Calder's movements. Funny, and Duchamp designs the invitation card, something Adam didn't know. Uh, you have a microphone. Amazing, it really is. I didn't know that. And so then in 32, post-February, Calder begins to realize that these, the, the motions of the motors, even though he times them to be highly um, inefficient, so they're not really that repetitive. They skip and they bump and they vibrate. They're irregular, and that's intentional to make them like human. But he realizes that if you suspend something from the ceiling, like his prior wire portraits that are moving in motion from suspension, he can create much more variability. And that's 1932 is the beginning of the suspended mobiles. 
So that's a very long answer to your question. I love it. Thank you, Sandy. I have a question for Raul, uh, which is... Uh, Go for it. And we'll bounce back to Sandy. So what I love about what you've done here, you've accentuated the fact that Calder is ultimately about gravity. Like, what, what makes this work? It's the gravity. It's the air. It's the center of the Earth. It's what, why they need to hang and why they need to move through gravity, right? Calder's ultimately like this unbelievable magician of gravity, mm -hmm. making natural objects by man. And here you've taken natural objects, it's photographed by man. Is the gravity the connection here? Like, what made you think of this? Uh, I think I was a little bit interested in the fact the medium seemed to define, like, we're not just trying to recreate colors here. So if we're using a different medium, like, if I, I mean, what I learned from talking with Sandy about color was he really pushed what he was doing in the real world. But when we take this into a digital space, what can we do in this space that we couldn't do in the real world? So I was kind of curious of like, what areas could we take this work and explore it? I guess um, this sense of the connection between each individual point and depicting how those things interrelate with each other, which has a sense of gravity, but it's almost like a... In, in the tools we use, it's called like a rig or a skeletal system, the way that you connect points in a kind of a hierarchy. So to try and follow or emulate the flow of his pieces, of his elements, and, and the, the way that that would create these wakes, these kind of, kind of complicated forms that would follow each piece, you almost have to look at maybe one of them to, to get a sense of it. Um, Now hold this a second. You got fooled by Adam, okay? You got suckered right into that gravity okay. thing. Explain it to me. Okay. I so, wasn't admitting gravity. So um, any of you who know me know that I immediately say, anytime I give a Calder tour, gravity is a theory. Now everybody says, oh wait, no, gravity is the force that holds us to Earth. Well, if you ride a carousel, you're thrown off the carousel. So why is the spinning Earth sucking us to it? Answer is we don't know. Gravity is a theory. Gravity is not a proven force. Yeah. So I'm not entering in on this one. <laughs> so um, my 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 purpose in saying that is it's a mystery, and Calder is dealing with the mysteries, the mysterious forces, and it's not just gravity. We can't see wind, but we can perceive it. We know that the leaves are blowing on the trees because of wind. We we think that's true. So convection is not gravity. It's another force. It's another mysterious and unseen force. We can't see it. We know this theory that the room's, room's going to warm up because a bunch of people here. That's not gravity, but that's an unseen force. And Calder's dealing with many, many, many unseen forces and bringing them through his sculpture like an antenna and grounding us to these forces and making us strangely aware of them through his metal. Now, the metal is not the work of art. It's your experience with the work of art, this thing, this metal, that, that is, is the work of art. Um, his friend Marcel Duchamp believed that the work of art is only 50%, and it's the viewer who completes the work of art. And Calder was definitely his partner in this kind of crime. So can I just go back to how Raoul and I were introduced? Now, of course, Raoul is quite famous in his world, so I knew of his uh, stature, if I can say that. That's nice, right? Um, and then um, Sinli's nephew, Derek, who's here somewhere, said, hey, what about this Raul guy? He's fucking awesome. Did I say fuck? Yeah, I think I did. Um, he's fucking awesome. And we had a call. Now, I was scared because he's just some digital guy. Like, he's making digital pictures. And, and, uh, I was scared. I was scared. Reasons. You were scared. We were, it was a scare fest. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we started talking about the nature of Calder and his work. And we went beyond the universe, we went to the universal. We went to what are these forces, these universal forces, and that, that's, the, that's where this all began, which is how unknown forces can coalesce into something in the 3D realm, so they can come from the upper dimensions, which are these ethereal realms in the fifth dimension, the ninth dimension, and come down into this more solid dimension and craft into a physical object and then spin out of this dimension. And so that's exactly what Raoul did. Um, 
you can see it. Um, some are, I mean, in, in fact, they're quite different. And each one of the five is a specific mobile, as, as you, can, you can obviously tell. Um, but we have these kind of long, we had a whole audience on our calls. We had Audrey and Sandy and many other people and Calder Foundation staff on the call. And it was just me and Raul, like, having a beer and talking about um, Calder. Often, often reasonably late in my evening. So yeah. I, I don't know how much sense I made. But very enjoyable conversations. I think it, like, I've always had a fascination with you know, a scientific understanding of the way that the universe is, and you have had since being a very young kid. But it, this is not a literal interpretation of those things, but it is, it's an interpretation of the, the sort of awe you get when you try and understand those things. Like, they're the kind of conversations you have as, as a young child, and I'm sure they're the conversations you have as you've become an old man. Like, they continue that kind of fascination with trying to understand what it is to exist and the edge of the universe and all those kind of topics. I like it, and I think it works. Um, made me think of gravity. <laughs> Realized that that was a theory. <laughs> but we're, we're, my we're question working for you. with electrons here and light. You know, there is no gravity in, 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 and that was kind of what was interesting about making this all in a digital space. Is like, you know, if I want to simulate gravity, I can simulate gravity, but there is no restrictions on on what we're, we're showing here, what we're making. No is, gravity in yeah. the internet. That's for sure. Exactly. You know. But how about this? So the other thing that I thought when I looked at these for the first time, this is just a thought, is were you um, inspired by or speaking specifically any real constellation? Absolutely not. I, I, I tend to sort of start with a far more, I guess, sort of a guttural feeling. It's sort of almost like you're trying to touch something or, and it's in your, in your gut, maybe more than your mind. Um, so, for example, with Untitled, it it's, has a really sort of suggests a plane, a sort of curved plane. Look, up, you have to sort of look up at at that mobile um, mobile. I'll never get the pronunciation right. I'm sure you'll correct me. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it it has this sense of sort of defining a an edge without actually doing that. So you kind of, I guess, I was. Those kind of things is where you start. It's like, well, what's this? What do I feel when I look at this work and get close to this work? And I got these amazing videos from the Calder and the rest of the team where they would go up and show me every individual join and talk about what it was doing and the sounds that were coming from the works and um, and how it moved and videos of how it moved. But just trying to capture that feeling was where I started. Nothing too prescriptive in terms of like looking up a constellation. I think, Raul, I think we should try and play one of these. Would you, guys, would you guys like to, because they actually have sound, and the sound is an important component. Which one do you want to play? Let's just play one. We could do Untitled. Actually, I, we're gonna play we're gonna play this one right here next because I want to talk about it just before just before we play it. Um, so this is part of our this is the last one Raúl did. It's number five, and it's a sculpture called Tines. Um, but wait, can we pause it? Can we off? Can we turn it off? Yeah. Um, so our process. So so the first one. 
These are in order? Who's the first one? Okay, so, so Raul, yeah, the first one is this one, right? Vertical yeah. foliage, I think. She starts um, with sort of the burst. So, so Raul made this. Now, my job is like an editor. I came in and Raul made this thing. He made like half of it. And I, and I looked at it and there was even, there was no sound at the like first, what's there sound I can't remember? Uh, very, very loose. Like some, some sound. And my job is to come in and criticize and say, this is what's wrong with it. This is where it needs to go, blah, blah, blah. Like this is our collaboration. He sent me this thing and I'm like, uh, well, one of the little linkages is not well rendered. <laughs> and uh, I had like nothing to say about it. I was really moved by it. I, it was, it was, um, it really shocked me. I mean, my friends who know me know I'm, you know, precise. We've done some projects together. He knows I'm very precise. And I'm, and in my own precision, whatever that even means. And I just, I couldn't say much. So Raul finished it and I was so shocked. And I thought, well, what's he going to do next after doing that amazing one? How could he do something otherwise amazing? And um, so I've just been totally in awe of the, of the project. Too kind. But I, no, I really mean it. And this, so this piece is um, a sculpture from 1943 where Calder has used little bits of, of broken glass and things, right? It's during World War II and he's repurposing garbage to make a mobile. And the main components are these three colored elements, which are the, the tines of a pitchfork from a farm that have broken off and they're in the garbage in his Connecticut farm where his studio is. And he excavates them out of the garbage and he realizes that they're beautiful forms and he makes them into this mobile. But this particular mobile actually has a sound component. It make, they, there are little tinkles and sounds from the, the interaction of the elements that hit each other intentionally. None of the others here do that, but this one does that. And so when Raul had finished it, he also did the sound. So when Raul had finished it with the sound, I went back and said, Raul, I really want you to integrate the sound of the actual mobile into, not like, you know, time stamped or anything, but the sound should be part of your soundscape. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Two more questions. Now you can choose which one of you <laughs> answers this question. The first question is, I'm going to give you both and then you choose. So the first question is, who chose these five mobiles? And on what basis were they chosen out of the thousand mobiles that Calder may have made in his lifetime? I don't know what the number is. Who chose these five and why? The second question is, is this work a Raoul? Is this work Calder? Who is, who, is signed? who is signing this work? When someone owns this work, is it your work, Raul, based on Calder? Is, it, is it the work of Alexander Calder, who was not here? How does that work? I'm going to answer both questions, um, and then Raul will answer both questions. Um, the, 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 the first part is um, these particular mobiles were chosen because of their... Um, they're, they're superstar mobiles. They've been in, you know, dozens, I would say thousands of exhibitions, but really literally dozens of monographic exhibitions. Each one of them are very, very famous works. Um, so the Calder community knows all these pieces, um, and they're quite different from each other. So um, there's one white disc mobile that's like, you know, some collectors think that's the epitome. Some other people think that the black mobiles are the epitome, like the eucalyptus or vertical foliage that belongs, you know, not for sale and everyone wants to buy it. 
Um, but it, it began with the question of education and what are the pieces we want to highlight and share and explain what is, what's called or trying to uh, communicate. So that's, that's how they were chosen. And they were chosen by uh, me and the Calder Foundation team and Audrey's team and through lots of discussion about how we um, can share what he's, what he's, what he's up to. What, what is Calder's dream? So um, that, that was pretty easy. And he made 1,200 hanging mobiles, which is not that many. In the scope of the 24,000 original works of art that he made, he only made 1,200 hanging mobiles. <clears throat> yeah. Picasso, who's that? Um, what was the other question? Owner of this, the owner of this, I go, I pass the test, I purchase this, I have this in my NFT collection. I know people have asked me about this. They're interested in participating in this project, owning one of these great works. Is this a Raoul? Is this a Calder? Where is that line? So it's, um, it's none of those things, in fact. And it's not for a person who wants to have a hanging mobile at home like you have. You're a polymath. You like all these things. But um, for the person who maybe can't afford a mobile at home but wants the sensation that Calder's trying to bring to us, that's been the challenge for us. How do we create a sensation? How do we... Because if you look at Calder on the Internet, you're looking at shapes, and they might even be moving, they might even be colored, but you're still not getting to where your body has this frequency with the sculpture, and something goes on in that mysterious realm. So these NFTs are describing a possibility. They're an experiment, and we don't pretend that they're perfect, right? They're not, they're not the experience of being with a Calder Mobile. Nothing can supplant that but they're an experiment of trying to do something other than a video of a Calder Mobile in motion as an NFT, which would be just garbage. That wouldn't make any sense. So um, what they are, are the Calder Foundation, you know, authorizing the use of Calder's genius to be explored by a guy who knows how to explore images, Raoul, um, and... Uh, in the future, in the next cycle of education and NFTs, I don't know how we're going to do something as amazing as this. It's going to be very, very difficult. Or you'll find a way. I don't know. We've been asking ourselves that question. Like, in the next cycle of education, what will be the NFTs? We, we know that we want to do a series on wire sculpting, wire sculpture that are the figurative wire sculptures, his first genius, his blue period, um, his invention of a whole medium would be really cool. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So they are what they are. They're not Calder's work, and they're not even Raoul's work. They're, they're existing in this, this um, sweet spot in the middle where we're all interested. And um, the Calder Foundation authorized the use for this purpose of getting closer. Thing. You learned something about Calder in this process? Uh, how how well did you know Calder before you began this process? And what did you learn about Calder through this process that you could share? Just a, 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 a prelude. So Raoul's wife knows something about art. And um, she's been like, you know, you're, st you're up all night making this stuff, da 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 And then all of a sudden Calder walks through the door and she's somewhat shocked. Yeah, my, my wife's a, um, a curator in the contemporary art world and very much in the, in the part of the art world that is perhaps slightly uh, suspect of anything happening in the NFT area, sort of a territorial kind of sense. Also, I'm her husband, so I, I don't think... Me interloping in any way into her world is, was very, going to be very well received. But um, I think she found it rather amusing that I was suddenly um, on the phone with Sandy uh, doing some work on something of the caliber of Calder. I was always aware of Calder. Um, I made the terrible faux pas of saying, I think we have like a mobile, uh, a copy of one of his. Um, on one of the first times I spoke to Sandy, he very quickly pointed out that it was most definitely a ripoff, um, in no way sanctioned piece of work. Um, but uh, I've, I've learned so much, you know, but I'm, I'm still like a, a fan more than I am an expert. I have got to know these five works intimately and learned a lot by looking at them. And it, 
it's something like you can read about an artist and understand a lot about what they were trying to do, but you know, I'm in a really kind of rudimentary way looking at every nut and bolt and every connection and how things are weighted. And you start to kind of understand there's this infinite level of complexity and interactions going on between each element, almost like at a, in an elemental way, you kind of start to understand the work and what he was trying to do. You know, you start to, you almost get to sense his fingers on everything he's touching. And that's quite a, that felt like quite a, a luxury for me to get that. Like this was, you know, I'm doing this in a, in a in a creative work kind of process, but I mean, I can imagine to a Calder fan, this would be an amazing insight to get, you know, to listen to Sandy and the rest of the team talk about the work, to have these videos, to see each individual piece, and then to recreate it. It's, it's um, a stunning experience. Well, what's wonderful about it is it's also sort of a barrier that most artists, especially artists' estates, artists' foundations, would never be found properly in an NFT. I mean, this is really the first one ever. And so for that alone, this is a major breakthrough and the beginning of a whole new chapter that I think will come. Let's open it up to questions, please. All of you for Sandy and for Raul. He said he loves NFTs. <laughs> I, th I think that it's a, quite a democratic price in the sense that it, it's not going to prevent many people from participating, and it's very well designed. Sin told me it was well designed, and now I'm sure it's well designed. One billion yen. So um, my friend Masha is asking about um, the financial component. Well, Raul got paid, for sure, and <laughs> oh, how much? One for each of you. Um, so, so the thing is, is it doesn't matter because you can all experience them. They're all available. Eventually, they're all available to experience. Uh, that you don't have to own them. It doesn't matter if you own them. You can see them on Instagram. You know, it's like that's the culture we're in. It doesn't matter if you own them. If you think that there's some sort of financial future in the Calder NFTs, you should just basically leave now, or you should have left already, um, because that's not what it's about. It's fine if they become one million dollars each. Who cares? It's not important. And there will be a secondary market and all of that. But they're they're um, I don't even know how these things get priced, and it doesn't really matter. If the Calder Foundation makes some money at the end, all of that money is going to go for restoration of Calder's work in public monuments. So not even things we own necessarily, but so if you go out to UNESCO here in Paris, there's an amazing Calder sculpture from 1958 called La Spirale that's in terrible condition because UNESCO has no money. And they've been talking for like 15 years to restore the sculpture and it's just getting worse and worse. And then they put some paint on it, which is bad and it's not to throw UNESCO under the bus, but um, it's, a, it's a disaster. And this money will go to restore that sculpture for, you know, in the public sphere. That's, that's what we've committed, if there is any money. I would speak to uh, Audrey over there and she will give you all the details. I actually don't know off the top of my head. Do you want to talk about it, Audrey? Do you want to do, do the, the basic details? Hi, Audrey. Got to get close. So there are 32 editions for the five artworks, and 32 is a magic number. That was, I think, we spoke about a little bit earlier in the conversation. 
if you go through all the educational quiz and the study room, then you're able to access it with a pre-sale with a 50% discount at $8,000. If you don't, it's $16,000. So the I, whole idea here, even throughout how we think about the artworks, is really wanting the reward to go to people who are spending a little of their time learning about Calder and engaging with Calder's works in a deeper manner. Thank you. That was a lot clearer than I could have put it. Wait, Audrey, Audrey, you told me it's working. Audrey, you told me that it was eight thousand dollars if you do the education and one million dollars if you don't do the education. I'm confused now. I don't know what she's getting sixteen from. I don't know. Does anyone else have another bright question for Raul or me? Well, Raul's much too busy with his day job, I, night job. I, I actually had done a project just previous to this with uh, a Chinese contemporary painter called Jia Ai Li. If you know his work. Um, oh, no, we spoke earlier, of course, yes. <laughs> Sorry, for the benefit of everybody else. Um, and that, well, that was great. So I, I guess collaboration is a really interesting thing. I, I think it's great to do. I, I probably would do something else next, but, but very open to doing something like this again in the future. It's, it's like a really wonderful kind of conversation to start, I think. And, and like, I mean, the NFT space in itself can kind of have little pockets that are not that interesting to be part of, and I, I've never really felt totally native to that world, so I'm quite interested in, in other places that it can go and where it can grow. Hologram technology. Great, tell me about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in things that can kind of try and exist in, in both spaces. So I think I've seen a few things with AR that start to do it, but I, I hadn't seen, I'm just yet to see anything amazing in holograms, but I might not be looking in the right place, but I'm, I'm all ears. So I guess like with these works and why the sound I think is so important is I, I, you want to trigger some kind of emotional response. And I, and I, like, as a visual person, I hate to admit it, but I think, like, audio is such an efficient way to, to get there, such a shorthand to, to create that feeling. Not tell someone what the feeling is, but for, to maybe get them to feel a bit of it. Um, and so I think that's what I was really trying to do with these, was, like, well, as I spend more and more time with each of these Calder works, what's my emotional response to it, and how do I, like not just describe that, but try to evoke the same feeling in people looking at the work. How effective is, is hard to say, that depends on the viewer, but um, that was the goal. There's a lot of Kubrick in there, yeah. It, it felt very organic. I mean, I, to be fair, I think at the beginning I was sort of terrified because this is sort of, you could say, like a hopeless task. Like, Calder is a, is a god. You know, you know, like, I mean, how, how do you go up against that? It's quite a daunting task. But I think if you're thinking of it as just trying to, like, translate it simply, then it's never going to, you're never going to work. It's never going to work. So it had to be, you had to add something of yourself in that process, and it had to be an emotional process, not a, a totally literal, cold, clinical kind of thing. And I think what was great about working with Sandy was it was terrifying enough to make me kind of keep pushing it little bit by little bit. Not with, like, direction, but with generally just with questions, I would say. So what's this? What's this? What are we doing here? Um, but I think that got us to a point where it felt, um, yeah, a very fluid process. But I want to I add that... Um We've talked about being terrified, but actually there's no, this is not fear-based, meaning that it's an experiment working with Sin and Audrey on this concept of education and connecting with the community. We're willing to fail. We're willing to just experiment and try it. And, you know, it's the Calder Foundation. Oh, my God, we have to be absolutely perfect. We can't fail. That's not true. We can fail. We can try something. We can do an exhibition that's kind of a bee. 
And then we can do an exhibition that's, that's an A quadruple plus, you know, like that blows your mind. And we didn't decide it was gonna blow your mind at the beginning, it just evolved into this amazing thing. And that's the process, that's how we do projects. So the educational component is its own thing, and then Raul's amazing contribution was also an experiment. I had to, very unusual for me to let go of my grandfather's image and like let somebody take it in a new realm. That's super unusual for me, but I just decided that this is a time to do this thing, and I, I think that the blockchain is a natural part of human evolution. I don't, I'm not fearful of blockchain. I think maybe AI is something we should be maybe concerned about because, um, you know, artificial intelligence will be weaponized for sure and will be commercialized and weaponized and then we're stuck. But the blockchain in its native sense is part of our evolution. And I think that's really interesting. So I, I, I you know, I took a chance, took a risk and I'm very happy. I'm, I'm happy you're happy. I mean, I, we started off with, I think, less ambition. That, that, that were shorter little pieces that was maybe a little more, had less breadth than what we were trying to explore. And then as we just, we kept working on vertical foliage, and that kept expanding. And we realized that maybe it had a bit more potential, a lot more we could do with it. We actually never, dis we never discussed um, time, how long the image should last, what's this cycle, and that they become this sort of epic, Films um, is, you know, like like highly concentrated miniature epic films was not something we thought about at the beginning. I mean, I, I didn't know if they were going to be five seconds. We didn't th even discuss timing. They just, are, and they're totally different lengths. Mr. Josh Bear has a question. Well, our first... My first conversation with Audrey and Sin was Art Basel, Miami Beach, last December. With Raul, I have no sense of time. Audrey, Derek, May. We started in May? Did we start in May? Maybe. Raul and I have no idea, but let's say May. I'm clueless. It was a while ago. It was many months ago. Yeah. Katerina has a question. Yeah, so the, the educational program and the whole project is called the Calder Question. And then that, the cute thing about it is that it's open-ended. What is the Calder Question? Well, go into the question of education and discover more about this artist, and maybe you have an answer. Or maybe you, or maybe you won't get, like, a hologram.